everybody. Welcome to the Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar Series. My name is Neha Ahuja, and I'm a postdoc at UT Southwestern, and I will be moderating today with Jason Smith, who is a postdoc at the University of Chicago. We are excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Yuki Shindo from Dartmouth and Rashmi Patel from NCI will share their research. Each speaker will give a 20-minute talk followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuki Shindo, who uh, again is a postdoc at Amanda Amoro's lab at Dartmouth. Yuki did his graduate training at Osaka University, where he looked at nuclear translocation in arc signaling using a combination of computational modeling and biochemical methods. He began his postdoctoral training in 2017, where he focuses on understanding mechanisms that govern the remodeling of the nuclear compartment. So please welcome Yuki. All right. So uh, thank you, Neha, for the great introduction. And also uh, thank you to the organizers for this postdoc seminar series for giving me the opportunity to present. And also thank you everyone for coming. So again, my name is Yuki Shindo. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my recent research on how embryonic programs are timed during early embryonic development. Okay, so as you know, development is dynamic in nature and normal development requires tight temporal control of cellular events. And, right, and this is critical, for, uh, in, is critical for important cellular events to occur at the right time and in the right order. And I'm interested in understanding the molecular and quantitative principles underlying the, the, underlying the temporal regulation in development. And to do that, we study the maternal to zygotic transition or MZT as a model. So basically the earliest stages of development depends on components that are provided by the mother, but as, as development progresses, zygotic control kicks in to take over the embryonic programs. This transition is called maternal to zygotic transition or MZT. And MZT occurs essentially in all mud cellular organisms but how this transition occurs at the right time has been a fundamental question in cell and de developmental biology. So we are trying to address this question using Drosophila embryo as a model. So here, this is an, uh, a Drosophila embryo in cell cycle 10, which means that this embryo has gone through nine divisions and is about to enter the cell cycle 10. And at this stage, the embryo undergoes rapid divisions in cell cycle 10, 11, 12, and 13. But after the 30th division, the embryo dramatically slows down the cell cycle and undergoes zygotic genome activation, leading to subsequent developmental events such as gastrulation. I'm going to play the movie one more time. And so initially, the embryo undergoes rapid divisions with little transcription. But after the 13th division cycle, the embryo undergoes dramatic cell cycle slowing and zygotic genome activation. And here, here's a schematic of Drosophila MZT that I just told you. Again, after fertilization, the embryo undergoes 13 rounds of divisions before MZT. And one remarkable phenotype that we focus on today is cell cycle slowing, where you have dramatic lengthening of cell, cell, cell cycle time uh, from as short as 10 minutes to more than an hour. So the question that we want to ask here is how the progression of embryogenesis is timed so that you can undergo cell cycle slowing at the right time. And today, I'm going to tell you two stories that address this question. So in the first part, I'll show you that the nuclear concentration of a cell cycle activator decreases over time, leading to cell cycle slowing in later stages. But I also show you that there are other proteins that behave differently, raising another important question about how nuclear composition is regulated dynamically to allow for proper control of timing, which I'll discuss in the second part. But overall, 
He proposed that dynamic changes in nuclear composition play a critical role in the control of timing of cell cycle slowly. Right. Okay, so let's begin with the first part. So previously, several groups, including our lab, have, sh have shown that histones play a significant role in regulating the timing of MZT. For example, when you decrease the amount of maternally deposited histones, you, uh, you have a delay in cell cycle progression. By contrast, if you increase the amount of maternally deposited histones, you have an acceleration of cell cycle. These observations suggest that histones have an inhibitory activity for cell cycle slowing. Okay. Then, obviously, the question would be how histones feed into the cell cycle. Uh, but, you know, because it's extremely well established that histones are a core component chromatin, a compelling hypothesis would be that the primary effect on the cell cycle would be through changes in chromatin state and or transcription, right? Surprisingly, however, we actually found that histones can regulate the cell cycle without chromatin association. Because when we expressed H3 tail that cannot bind chromatin, it was actually still sufficient to, to phenocopy the histone overexpression. And here is the actual data. And uh, in the wild type control embryos, there is an increase in cell cycle duration from cycle 11 to cycle 13. When we expressed H4 tail, the cell cycle dynamics were exactly the same as control embryos. However, when we expressed histone H3 tail, cell cycle durations were significantly shorter. In addition, we observed that about 20% of H3 tail embryos underwent an extra division, which is an extreme case of misregulation of cell cycle slowing. So these data indicate that the histone tail that cannot bind chromatin is sufficient to affect the cell, to affect cell cycle. But how is it H3 tail? that cannot bind chromatin can affect the cell cycle. So uh, <clears throat> it's well known that the early cell cycles in the of the embryo depends on the kinase, but it's well known that cell cycle slowing in the early embryo depends on the kinase called check one, which is an evolutionary conserved kinase that is involved in the DNA damage checkpoint pathway in many eukaryotic cells. <clears throat> And long story short, what we found is that histone eight C tail can actually act as a competitive inhibitor of check one, thereby directly controlling cell cycle slowing. So what we did is basically uh, uh, is that we performed in vitro kinase assays where we have recombinant check one and its substrate in the presence of either H3 tail or just GFP as negative control. And not surprisingly, uh, Negative control of GFP alone didn't affect phosphorylation of its substrate, but we found that H3 tail does inhibit check one phosphorylation of, of substrates uh, in a concentration dependent manner. This is a quantification of this gel, and this data suggests that histone H3 is actually a signaling molecule that can directly control the cell cycle. In addition, what's really interesting to us is that we found that histone levels in the nucleus decrease over the course of early embryogenesis. So here I'm showing uh, total H3 levels in the nucleus. And uh, we found that total H3 levels uh, decrease by almost 60% from cycle 10 through cycle 13. So together, what we think is happening is that in all these cycles where you have lots of histone proteins, H3 inhibits check on activity to allow for rapid cell divisions. But as development progresses, you lose, uh, you, you decrease histones, uh, you decrease histones in the nucleus, uh, leading to the repression of check one activity and cell cycle slowing in later cell cycles. Okay, so to summarize the first part, uh, we found that nuclear concentration of histone H3, which is actually a signaling molecule to regulate cell cycle activator, to, cell cycle, to, to regulate cell cycle progression, decreased over time and thereby controlling the timing of cell cycle slowing. Okay, so this is the first part. And in the rest of my talk, 
I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I will focus on how nuclear protein concentration are regulated dynamically during all the embryogenesis. Uh, so for example, when we looked at other nuclear, pro other nuclear proteins, we actually saw that they show different dynamics. And we are really interested in understanding how nuclear composition is uh, regulated dynamically to allow for proper control of timing of cell cycle slowing. And in the rest of my talk, I'm going to tell you about a mechanism where nuclear transport plays a critical role in regulating this process. And I'm going to focus in particular on the nuclear pro complex or NPC, which is the gateway for nuclear transport. And I'm going to say NPC is literally 100 times in the rest of my talk. So I would kindly ask you all to remember that NPC means the nuclear pro complex, which is a gateway for nuclear transport. All good? Okay, and the reason why we, the reason why we focus on NPCs is because we found that the number of NPCs changes dynamically during all the embryogenesis. So what I'm showing here is endogenously taxed NAP NAP ninety six GFP, which basically tells you about the abundance of NPCs on the nuclear membrane. And these are individual nuclei, and this is a zooming image of a single nucleus. I hope you can appreciate that signal intensities decrease over time, indicating that NPC number decrease over the course of all the embryogenesis. Okay, and this is really exciting and interesting to us, but obviously the question would be how the decrease in NPC number affect nuclear transport. And one possible scenario is that actually there is no effect on nuclear transport because it's been shown that NPC has really high capacity for nuclear transport. But another possibility would be that a reduction in, in NPC number leads to downregulation of nuclear transport, which has been proposed to occur in some cell types. And finally, you could have upregulation of nuclear transport, although it's kind of it's sort of counterintuitive. So to test these possibilities, we, we focused on this very simple synthetic cargo, NLS RFP, uh, which is basically just a monomeric RFP with a short nuclear localization signal. And again, NPC number decreased over the course of embryogenesis. But very interestingly, we found that nuclear NLS RFP levels increase during this period. And more strikingly, when we partially depleted NPCs using RNAi, we had even more accumulation of NP of nuclear. We had even more accumulation of NLS RFP. So these data indicate that a reduction in NPC number can actually lead to upregulation of NLS RFP import. And this is this is sort of a very you know, counterintuitive result, and we really is interested in understanding what is happening. And when we say nuclear transport, there are actually two different processes. One is directional active transport that depends on transport receptors such as importing. And another process is non-directional passive transport where, the, where relatively small sized molecules of less than 40 kD passively diffuse through NPCs. And because these two processes are very different in terms of the underlying biochemical and biophysical mechanisms, we wondered, we wondered if NPCs may have differential effects on these two processes. Okay. So to test this possibility, we, we looked at how changes in NPC numbers affect passive transport process. So we performed a FRAP-like ex FRAP -like experiments using NLS dendra, which is a photoconvertible protein. So this protein is, is basically nuclear localized because of active import mechanism, but it also undergoes passive import and passive export. So the experiment, what we, what we did is that we changed the color of this protein in the nucleus and look at the loss of red proteins in the nucleus to quantify the rate of passive transport. So this is an example of the experiment and I did this wrap like experiments at different different embryonic stages. And what we found is that passive transport rate actually decreased in later stages where NPC number is reduced, suggesting that NPC number affects passive transport rate. 
Okay. What about active transport? So next, we estimated the rate of active import using a simple mathematical modeling. And I'm going to skip the details of the model, but here, here I show uh, I show passive transport rate in x axis and active active import rate in y axis. And if data are plotted diagonally, that would mean that both active and passive transport process changes. Whereas if data are plotted horizontally, that would mean that there is no change in active import. And here's the actual data. And I hope you can appreciate that the slope is much less steep compared to this diagonal, indicating that active, trans active import doesn't change as much as passive transport. Okay, overall, what we think is happening is that when you have a large number of NPCs, the passive transport process can somewhat counteract active import, but this effect can get weaker as NPC number decrease because active import remains relatively unchanged, whereas passive, passive diffusion decrease. So you, end, you can end up with more accumulation of proteins in the nucleus, even, even when you are, you are decreasing NPC number. So we propose that NPC number is a regulator that modulates the balance between active and passive transport process. Okay, and finally, we wanted to ask if these changes in NPC number have any meaningful effect on development. So to, to do that, we partially depleted NPCs using RNAi and looked at how it affects cell cycle dynamics. And here, x-axis is embryo stage and y-axis cell cycle durations. And we found that overall cell cycle durations were longer when NPC was depleted, indicating that NPC number is important for proper pacing of early embryogenesis. Okay. So to summarize the second part, we found that <clears throat> we found that the number of NPCs decrease over the course of embryogenesis, and this changes the balance between active and passive transport processes. And because uh, different cargos have different dependency on active and passive transport processes, this can allow this would allow for dynamic and global remodeling of nuclear composition, which would be critical. For, for, the, for the control of timing during all, during all the embryogenesis. Okay, and to summarize, to summarize overall, <coughs> uh, <coughs> to summarize overall, we studied how the timing of embryonic programs are controlled. And this is a fundamental and long-standing question in developmental biology. And in the first part of my talk, I, I showed an evidence, I showed evidence for a non canonical role of histone H3 as a signaling molecule that promotes cell cycle progression. And we show that its nuclear concentration decreases over time, leading to cell cycle slowing in the later stages. And in the second part, I focused on how nuclear composition is regulated dynamically. And I showed how changes in NPC number influence nuclear transport processes process and early embryonic cell cycles. So together, these mechanisms allow for dynamic uh, control of nuclear, nuclear composition and function to coordinate the progression of, of embryonic development. So this mechanism will allow for dynamic control of nuclear composition and function to coordinate the progression of embryonic development and with the timing of embryonic programs. Okay, so this work was done in the Amadeo lab at Dortmund, and uh, uh, I want to thank everyone who, who gave me uh, general support and technical support and resources and, um, and helpful discussion. And also like to thank uh, funding sources. Right, uh, that's all for today, and thank you very much for, for, your, for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Yuki, for that really beautiful talk. Um, so we actually already have a question uh, in the webinar chat. Uh, for those of you in the audience members, can you please uh, put more questions um, in the question and answer box? Um, and so the first question is from Jessica Feldman. She says, really great talk. 
Is this histone concentration model affected by, or perhaps if it affects the introduction of gap phases? Right, so uh, as you know, the early embryonic cell cycles uh, don't have gap phases. So, uh, in, so basically, uh, the, this mechanism, uh, I, I, the short answer is I, I don't know the exact answer for that. So, um, because in the cell, in the normal cell cycles where uh, you have gap phases and longer cell cycles, right? Um, you have you have a more uh, tight control of histone abundance, uh, and basically histone synthesis is tightly restricted in S phase. So you have uh, less you know fluctuations in histone concentration during the cell cycle. So uh, yeah, so basically. Uh, the nature of histone, con the, the nature of regulation of histone abundance and concentration uh, changes a lot after MZT, where you have uh, the introduction of gap phases and more tight control of histone levels. affect the NPC number through in early development? And if so, what their developmental phenotype is? So yeah, I, I don't think I can hear you. Sorry, Um. okay. Can you hear me okay now? Oh yeah, yeah I can hear you. Perfect, I was just wondering if there's any um known sort of genetic mutants that can impact the number of NPCs in early development and what their overall phenotype in, in development would be? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a great, I think that's a great question. So basically the question is how, how the number of NPCs is regulated in the first place. And that's a very uh, interesting basic cell biology question. And basically we don't really know how it is regulated, but interesting correlation we know is that, you know, Stem cells, like cells like stem cells tend to have many NPCs, but as cells undergo differentiation, cells tend to lose the number of NPCs. So apparently there is a like, there's a really nice correlation between how many NPCs you have and how uh, behave you like as a cell, you know. Okay, so our next question uh, is very nice talk. Did you check any alteration in transcription if you increment the cell cycle time at early stages? Yeah, that's also a very good question. And we haven't looked at that yet, but yeah, but it, it would be really interesting to look at how transcription changes in response to uh, alterations of you know, histone levels or changes in NPC numbers. That, that's really be a great question. Awesome. Um, okay, so our next uh, question is, cool talk, if I understand correctly, you propose that the MZT depends on nucleoplasm protein composition because of lower MPCs. Any lead onto what is accumulating in the nucleus to trigger MZT? Yeah, that's also a very great question. So yeah, so I think what basically, I think that question would be what determine the specificity for like the order of nuclear transport or uh, yeah, in, in response to changing NPC numbers. Uh, we don't know the answer yet, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, but I think I would assume that factors such as the size of cargoes that would alter the, the, the rate of passive transport and also uh, uh, import, so import pathways. So, I mean, types of nuclear localization signals, types of nuclear export signals, uh, those would add like more you know, dimensions in, the, like the nature of the, the transport regulations in this process. And I, I'm really excited to look at the, the, the question that you asked. So I have a couple more questions. So uh, are there mutant lines of MPCs that survive as opposed to the RNAi lines? Yeah, so I've tried a lot of mutant lines. Uh, I've, I've, like, I've done a, a baby screening for you know, mutant that may alter the NPCs. I, I haven't been able to get like a nice hit for that. So yeah, so the, the manipulation, the NAP96 RNAi that I showed today is like, is the only uh, you know, reasonable manipulation that I can have in the fly embryo. In other cell types, uh, I mean, in other species, uh, you know, there are other 
some uh, nuclear point mutants that can alter the NPC numbers. Uh, some are nuclear, some are scattered for the nuclear points uh, that are essential for the assembly of nuclear core complex on the nuclear membrane. Yeah, so yeah, but uh, at, at at my end, I have I haven't been able to look at other manipulations. Our next question is awesome talk. Have you seen any delay in main developmental events due to the slowing down, uh, such as earlier gas relation entry, et cetera? Yeah, that's also a great question. Uh, short answer is I haven't looked at it yet, but it would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, if 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 it changes in NPC number, have really like have you know more developmental effect in terms of you know self aid decisions in later stages. Okay, so are there any last questions? Uh, okay, so I think that we've answered all of the questions. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and go on to our next talk. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason, our next moderator. Uh, thank you, Neha and Yuki. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Rashmi Patel. Rashmi received her PhD in the lab of Dr. Akhtar Ali at Banaras Hindu University, where her thesis involved the genomic analysis of congenital limb malformations in humans. Rashmi is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Susan Makum at the NIH, National Cancer Institute, where she continues to investigate the molecular mechanisms that underpin mammalian limb development. Uh, Rashmi has been very productive as a postdoc, publishing seven papers so far with another paper, the focus of her talk today, in preparation. Uh, for her outstanding work as a postdoc, Rashmi was awarded the 2024 Fellows Award for Research Excellence by the NIH Fellows Committee. Uh, Rashmi's earlier work in the Makem Lab generated key insights into how mesodermal zone of polarity activity, ZPA, and the AER, a specialized ectodermal tissue, interact to control posterior div digit number in mouse. The subject of her seminar talk today is her ongoing work using cell developmental and transcriptomic approaches to investigate the dynamic regulation of the ZPA and sonic hedgehog responsiveness in the mouse limb. We look forward to your talk, Rashmi. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Jason, for introducing me. And I would like to thank SDB for giving me this opportunity to share my work with you. And thank you everyone for joining my talk today. So my research focuses to understand dynamic nature of sonic hedgehog lineage and responsiveness using mouse limb body. So hedgehog signaling have major role to play during patterning and growth of multiple organs that includes limb bud development, which is of my interest. So alteration in hedgehog signaling contributes to several human disorders that include limb defect and also leads to cancer. During embryonic limb bud development, Sonic hedgehog expressed in posterior side of limb bud in a specific zone called as zone of polarizing activity, ZPA, and it regulates both digit number and identity. Sonic hedgehog positive descendant cell give rise to posterior digit four and five. A very recent study from our lab published shows that Sonic hedgehog is required transiently as a trigger, not as a morphogen to specify all five digits, working as a sort range. But the non-ZPA digits one, two, and three, they are specified indirectly. Later stages, sonic hedgehog response is long range, but this long range response is only required to promote cell survival, but not for patterning. As a quick review, sonic hedgehog is expressed in posterior side of limb bud from very early E10 to the late stages E12 of embryonic stages. During this window of time, both sonic hedgehog expression dynamics and as well as response changes a lot. In the absence of hedgehog ligand, GLE2 and GLE3, which is the nuclear transducer for this signaling, 
undergo proteolytic cleavage to produce truncated form of glees called as GLE2 and GLE3 repressure, which represses target gene expression. When hedgehog binds with receptor patch, inhibition of smoothen is relieved and GLE2 and GLE3 stabilize in its full length activator form. So this activator promote the expression of downstream target gene expression. One of the target gene is patch one, which is also a primary receptor for this signaling, provides a basis, of, basis for negative feedback regulation. To understand the dynamics of sonic hedgehog expression and response, we performed linear stressing experiment using sonic hedgehog CRE-ER and gliwan CRE-ER in same cross. So gliwan CRE-ER marks the descendant of early sonic hedgehog producing cells at the time of tamoxifen treatment, whereas gliwan CRE-ER marks the descendant of uh, responder cells at the time of tamoxifen treatment. So this particular strategy where we used both CRE-ER in same cross allowed us to compare sibling embryos with identical tamoxifen exposure time and embryonic age. So we injected mouse very early in 9.5 with tamoxifen and collected the embryo later stages E13.5 when digit rays has been formed. And then we analyze the contribution of early sonic hedgehog expressing and responding descendants to different digits. Our linear stressing experiment clearly suggests that both sonic hedgehog expressing and responsing domain are highly dynamic and are changes over time. We first notice that sonic hedgehog expression first appear and restricted to digit four territory only, but later this domain shifted to digit five territory. In the case of response, ZPA was responsive at early stage, but soon become non-responsive. So this loss of response is reversible and also changes its domain. We also noted that as sonic hedgehog domain shifted from digit four to digit five territory and sonic hedgehog expression in digit four declines, response resumes again. We think that shift in sonic hedgehog expressing cells may enable responsiveness in both digit four and digit five territory at different time, which is required for proliferation and to promote posterior digit formation. This kind of dynamic can also be appreciated on HCR in situ. So HCR is a hybridization chain reaction, it's a fluorescent in situ. So we notice that early stages sonic hijag response is present in the ZPA region, but later stages this response is gone. And this kind of loss of responsiveness uh, can be appreciated also on both end of refractory domain. So we notice the response was present in the proximal domain of refractory domain, and then it lost and then resumes again when sonic hijag expression declines. So we think that the sonic hedgehog expression and the loss of response are probably related. And interestingly, these two phenomena where uh, sonic hedgehog producing cells loses the response is an evolutionary conserve phenomena. For example, in the case of Drosophila, hedgehog producing wing disc cells do not respond to hedgehog signal and which is co-regulated by engrailed. But in the case of mouse, the regulation appear different and I think it's more complex. And we also think that non-responsiveness in the case of mouse limbard is linked with Sony hedgehog production. But how ZPA response is modulated and why this is necessary? This is something we are actively examining in our lab. For today's talk, I will just focus on dynamics of sonic hedgehog expression. So as I mentioned before, sonic hedgehog expression first appeared and restricted to digit four, but later moved to digit five territory. 
This suggests that there is an ongoing recruitment of ZPA population rather than expansion of single ZPA progenitor pool. We would like to identify the ZPA progenitor pool that undergo recruitment into the ZPA population. To understand the dynamics of sonic hedgehog expression in response at single cell level, we performed single cell transcript profiling from four different hind limb bud stages, ranging from 29 somites when sonic hedgehog expression just initiated to 31 somites when the role in specification of digits completed to 33 somites when long range response just detected to 35 somites when long range response well established and ZPA shipped from digit four to digit five territory. In our single cell analysis, we found that sonic hedgehog producing cells uh, cluster separately from rest of the mesodermal cluster. For our analysis, we only selected sonic hedgehog positive subset and this U-map showing the cluster subset with four stages color-coded. We noticed that the top cluster six can, uh, enriched at early stages and also contains cells from all the stages. Whereas cluster zero and cluster eight, they are enriching only at the later stages. To further understand the dynamics of uh, sonic hedgehog expression in this subset, we performed velocity analysis, which calculate the rate of transcription, which is based on uh, calculating spliced and unspliced transcript and predict the future state of cells and to draw a trajectory. So in this particular subset, trajectory is going from top to bottom cluster, which correlates with early to late stage. This velocity analysis also suggests six as a root cluster, which contains cells from all the stages and probably represent early progenitor pool. Apart from temporal progression, differential expression between cluster shows a spatial progression from proximal to distal limb bud. These are some examples from proximal markers which are enriching mainly in top early stage cluster, whereas CYP26B1 and HOCS A13, which are distal markers, were enriched in bottom late stage cluster. So I would like to show one example from proximal markers, which are particularly interesting and intriguing. intriguing. So this example is Piadium 1. As I mentioned, this is a proximal marker and express proximal to the ZPA and also extends to the lateral plate. Linear stresses to ZPA and study also suggests that Piadium 1 regulates sonic hedgehog expression. So I will come to this Piadium 1 later too. Okay, so summarizing my single cell data, I've shown you that trajectory progresses from top to bottom cluster. And the top cluster six, which is a root cluster, it contains cells from all the stages and it enriched for early stage, but proximal markers. Whereas bottom cluster zero and eight, they enriched for late stage, but distal markers. So based on all these information, I would like to propose a working model in which new cells are continuously recruited into the ZPA from uh, proximal limb bud margin over the time. And the cells entering the ZPA displace distal over the time. To further confirm our impression and validate our proposed model, we performed linear stressing experiment, but this time we use Rosa Tomato as a reporter. So here we are marks, we marks the descendants of E10.5 sonic hedgehog positive cells with Rosa Tomato by injecting tomaxifen at E10.5 and we collected the embryos at E11.5, and we marked the sonic hedgehog expressing cells at this stage using HCR in situ. 
and then we examine the relationship between early sonic hedgehog expressing cells with late sonic hedgehog expressing cells in the ZPA. We found that early sonic hedgehog expressing cells were displaced distally at late stages, but the new cells, sonic hedgehog positive cells, appear near proximal limbed border which is consistent with our proposed model where new cells are recruiting from proximal limbic border. And the cells entering the ZPA, they are displaced over the time to the uh, distal position. This kind of model where sonic edge of function and expression dynamics is very different from other organ system where sonic edge of function has been studied. So comparing limb with other organ system will provide as a clue as to why. So here I'm comparing limb with notochord floor plate. So both of these signaling centers are refractory to sonic hedgehog response. But in the case of notochord, this is a dedicated signaling center only and do not proliferate. But in the case of limb ZPA, they give rise to digit four and five, which require proliferation. So as I mentioned before, we think the shift in sonic hedgehog expressing domain enables responsiveness in both digit four and five at different time, which is required for proliferation and promote digit formation. In the case of notochord, there is no evidence that support the existence of progenitor pool. But in the case of limb, we think there exists a proximal progenitor pool that renews. To further confirm this renewing progenitor population pool, we decided to ablate Sony Khedog expressing cells using Rosa DTA line. So DTA is a transgenic diphtheria toxin A that inhibit protein synthesis and promote cell autonomous cell death. So here we are ablating Sony Khedog expressing cells using Rosa DTA line. In the case of Sony Kejog knockout, many organs are abnormal that include absence of spine, which is due to lack of notochord. But the limb is also very reduced with no digit and long bones also very abnormal. This is because of lack of ZPA. When we ablated Sony Kejog population using Rosa DTA line, we noticed that the F, uh, spine was absent, which is very similar to sonic hedgehog knockout phenotype. But the limb have very mild phenotype with the loss of posterior digit only. Rest of the digits and the long bones develop normally. This extremely mild phenotype in the case of limb clearly supporting our model and suggesting that there is an ongoing recruitment from proximal pool to the ZPA and that contribute to robustness in the case of limb. Furthermore, removal of sonic hedgehog from early limb mesoderm and from proximal lateral plate border using B63ER, which recombine in both the places, result in very severe phenotype with loss of digits and long bone also very abnormal. So this phenotype is very much similar to sonic hedgehog knockout phenotype. But when sonic hedgehog is removed only from early limb mesoderm, not from lateral plate border using PRX3, the phenotype was quite mild with the loss of posterior digit only all the other digits and the long bones develop normally. So this clearly support that sonic hedgehog progenitor pool is present somewhere in the proximal lateral plate border. So at the end, I would like to summarize my talk today. I, I have shown you that ZPA composition is dynamic and it changes over time. There is an ongoing recruitment of proximal progenitor pool, which is a non-ZPA population contribute to robustness in the case of limb. 
we also showed you that the shift in sonic hedgehog population enables responsiveness in both digit four and digit five territory at different time, which required for proliferation and also for posterior digit formation. So this is an ongoing work. In the short term, we would like to demonstrate this proximal progenitor pool and their entry inside the ZPA domain. For that, we would like to use one of the tool called PRDM1 CREAR. So PRDM1, as I mentioned before, is one of the proximal marker which expressed in proximal to the ZPA and also extend to the lateral plate. Linear stresses to ZPA and also regulate sonic hedgehog expression. One of the very um, recent data, I would say it's non-published data, is when sonic hedgehog is removed using PRDM1 Cree, the phenotype is very much se severe and it's like sonic hedgehog knockout phenotype. So this clearly suggests that this PRDM1 domain harbors the proximal progenitor pool. In the long-term goal, I would like to characterize these progenitors and study their regulation and recruitment into the ZPA population. At the end, I would like to thank my mentor, Susan Maycomb, for supervising this project, my colleagues and collaborators who is associated with this project, and also CDBL members and NCI. And thank you all for listening and I'm happy to have any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Rashmi, for the excellent talk. Uh, we're gonna now transition to the Q&A period. Um, I, I just have just a, a basic question to begin with because I'm kind of interested and then and then we'll, we'll move on to some uh, audience questions. So I'm, I'm wondering, could you just talk a little bit about the initial establishment of the PZA position in the posterior, like where it, how it's established there like how does that happen zpa established like patterning yeah no. like how is it localized there yeah okay so you're talking about like how the sort range signaling is specify all digit being in the posterior side only so this is from our previous work uh, actually, we think this is something like indirect signaling, some kind of relays going from posterior side to specify all digit very early. But what is this indirect relay that we don't know? But yeah, this is not direct, it's something like indirect because being in posterior side, so Nikita can specify all five digits. So yeah, this is something indirect relay. Okay. Um, so we have a question uh, from the audience. Nice talk. In single cell data, why did clusters labeled as zero comma five, uh, oh. do you remove some clusters from subset? Okay, so uh, I think this is a technical question and very nice observation, I would say. Uh, so yes, yeah, so initially when we selected ZPA uh, pool, we clustered them and it was like zero to nine cluster. But what we found is that in some of the cluster have only few fewer cells and also the sonic hedgehog read is like very low. So we excluded those clusters which have like very low number of read or low number of cells and only included a uh, few cluster. So for our future analysis, we keep the cluster numbering same and we remove other clusters. So yes, we remove something. So yeah, thank, thank you for asking. Okay, um, we have another question from Manish Chahan. Very nice talk. If both digit four and digit five are sonic hedgehog dependent, then why only digit four is lost in the Rosa DTA line? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So uh, yes, this, uh, both like digit four and digit five are sonic hedgehog lineage, but First thing first, I don't know which digit is lost. If it's just sometime, uh, just one digit is lost when we are removing with Rosa DTA. But sometime I see more than one digit lost, like both digit four and digit five are lost. Um, but it's hard to say like digit four is lost or digit five is lost. But I think this is because of variability of phenotype in this mutant. Um, 
Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I hope I answered the question. And there's a, a follow-up question from Manish as well. Uh, did you check dorsal ventral polarity markers in Sonic Hedgehog subset? Oh, you mean single cell data? Oh, uh, so yes, we definitely can check, but we did not focus on dorsal ventral polarity there because our question is how the ZP, uh, ZP progenitor pool like uh, contributing to this robustness kind of thing. But uh, if we include dorsal ventral polarity there, I think this would create more complex analysis. So for this reason, I think we decide to include this, but well, we definitely can do it. We, we, we did not see dorsal ventral polarity. Okay, um, we have another question. Nice talk. This is a curious question. What is the signaling pathway that defines variable length of each of the digits? Does Sonic Hedgehog play a role? Oh, okay, so this is a very, very good question, but it's not related with this talk, but how this digit length is regulated. Um, so I think there are some studies showing like different um, rate of uh, cell proliferation in different digits that can contribute like different length. Uh, Sonic Hedgehog is mainly responsible for patterning at early stages. As I mentioned, the later stages, they are promoting cell proliferation. So they might have some role, but I'm, I'm not sure about uh, it, like how they can regulate the digit length. I have no idea. Okay, we have um, another question. Is there any specific reason to select PRDM1 tool to demonstrate proximal progenitor and not other markers? Can you show this by live imaging? Oh, that's a very good question. So I think I have two questions. The PRDM1 Cree, because yeah, we can definitely choose other proximal markers too. But for choosing the PRDM1 is several, as I mentioned, uh, as I discussed in my future plan, the first reason was to, because this is the PRDM1 expressing in the ZPA domain, clearly the linear stresses to ZPA and also like proximal to the ZPA. And there are some reports showing that PRDM1 regulates sonic hedgehog expression and also, also uh, when the sonic hedgehog is removed in the PRDM1 domain, the phenotype is very severe to like mimicking sonic hedgehog knockout phenotype. So this kind of data clearly saying that PRDM1 reason actually harboring the ZPA pop, uh, progenitor population. And the one of the main reason I would say to selecting PRDM1 is the availability of mouse line. So PRDM1 Cree, our mouse line is available and we are working on it. We already have in our lab. But if other proximal Crees are available, we definitely can try. It's just availability of Cree. And the second question was, uh, sorry. Can, can you, you show this by live imaging? Oh, live imaging. Okay, so live imaging is um, it's hard to do in mouse, uh, in the case of mouse embryos. Uh, but we definitely can do using cell line, but I don't think there is very good stabilized limbert culture. I think there are some some groups doing this limbert culture, but I'm not sure how much they are accurate to mimicking the in vivo system, uh, because as far as my knowledge, the limbert culture, in the culture, limbert grows in slower rate, I think. Uh, so I have just like concerned about mimicking it to the real in vivo system, but yeah, definitely we can give it a try. Th thank you for suggestion. Um, we have another question. This comes from Augusto Ortega. Did you find cells in your single cell experiment that may correspond to the predicted progenitor pool, maybe on the Sonic Hedgehog clusters? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So basically what we did in our single cell analysis, we selected only sonic hijab positive cells. So my impression with our data is the proximal progenitor pool is not sonic hijab producing cells. It's something that exists proximal to the ZPA. So the cluster number six, which I'm saying is the one which is very close to ZPA progenitor pool. So 
So I think the cluster number six contains the cells which is coming from the proximal progenitor pool. So in, in my subset, I, we don't have proximal progenitor pool, but it's the, the one pool I'm talking about is just like, you know, the entry zone from the pool. Uh, for 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 analyzing this proximal progenitor pool, of course, we have to include some cells also in the ZPA region, like PRDM1 positive cells in our analysis. That's something uh, we haven't done yet. Okay, uh, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I'll ask one more question while we wait and see if we get some more. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, do you have any idea what could be going on with the recruitment dynamics to bring you know, cells from the proximal pool to the ZPA? Oh, this is something like our long-term plan. We don't know how this, like the cells is entering into the ZPA and how they are being regulated. This is something like it's my future plan that we will definitely work. So this is very preliminary data I'm showing. And this is like our, our proposed uh, uh, theory. So this is something we will answer in the future, I guess. Very exciting. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, I, I will close. Uh, thank you so much, Rashmi, for the excellent talk. Um, and uh, thank you, Yuki and, Ra and, um, and Rashmi again for excellent talks. The seminar has been recorded and will be available on the SDB website next week. Please join us for next month's seminar on Friday, January 12th, when Lydia Janune from Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and Grant and Jindal from UC San Diego will present. Finally, thank you all for attending today's SDB Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar.